Um, good afternoon and welcome to the Investor Mindset Masterclass. My name is Bongiwe Momoza and I'm a senior consultant from the SASFIN Asset Consulting team. We're glad we could join us uh, today for this uh, discussion around the topic of the investor mindset in the wake of the prevailing market conditions. Um, so whilst this is not the first time we have experienced market instability due to crisis, I mean, there was a stock market crash in the 80s. Um, we've seen the recession in the early 90s, the mini stock market crash in the late 90s, and the US bear markets between 2007 and 2009. It can, however, be said that the humanitarian, social, and even the fiscal challenges brought about by COVID-19 are historically severe and that the economic harm to businesses and investors mounts uh, daily. And I think we can also agree that uh, within the eye of the storm, it can be very difficult to actually devise uh, the most potent uh, strategies that will actually assist investors weather the storm. And today, to help us unpack uh, this topic are seasoned professionals who I'm very happy to be in, in the midst of, who have actually witnessed multiple historic chaffs and peaks, which have actually provided them with a unique skill set to actually react effectively in uncertain times. And the way we see this discussion unfolding uh, today is in four chapters. So we'll start off with the perspective of the experience of the collective uh, individuals within the panel. And we'll also delve in a bit deeper into in terms of what's different about this crisis, if anything at all. And just looking at the response to the crisis, what we'll need to learn uh, this time and then we'll close off with um, some views of the future from the present. So in our panel today, first of all, we have Sasfin Securities Deputy Chairman, David Shapiro. Welcome to you, David. And uh, he will be in conversation with fund managers, Bruce Ackerman, who manages the Sasfin Global Equity Offshore Fund, and Errol Shia, who manages Sasfin's Value Equity and Absolute Return Funds. Welcome to both of you, Bruce and Errol. And we're also joined by our, um, the chairman of the Solidarity Fund and founding member and executive director of WIPHOLD and chief executive officer of WIP Capital, uh, Mamu Gloria Sirobe. Welcome to you, Gloria. So let's get started. Um, just now looking at the wisdom uh, from past experiences. So this question really is to all of you, but I'll start off with uh, David. David, you've seen, uh, several crashes over four or five decades, uh, respectively. What insight can you actually give us from that vantage point? I, I think um, if we look back on this crisis, um, I've been through many crises before, and everyone has a different characteristic. Um, you know, this one, the characteristic of this one has been that, of course, it's a health hazard, and it's rather than a financial hazard. So uh, to see a complete lockdown of the global economy is something that we haven't dealt with. But if we go back in the past, the one thing that comes through in all of these crises is that people are very resilient. Um, and markets have bounced back much faster than we thought, even in this case. Uh, we hit a low in March um, 23rd, and from, you know, from that date onwards, we've actually recovered very, you know, very significantly. And this goes back to the many crises that, we, that we've been through. So I think that this, you know, the, the approach that we took was, uh, or certainly from, from our team's point of view, is just to hang in there. And it's a very difficult thing just to hang in there. But you find that economies do, do tend to come back uh, pretty fast in different shapes and in different forms. So um, the, other, you know, the, the, uh, the other aspects that we learned um, you know, of course, it's, um, it's, it's, it's not really to panic and, uh, you know, to, you know, just, just to, um, just to hold on. Oh, sorry, the other point I was thinking of, what we find, and this is the danger, is that people who sell out, in other words, who get out of the market, never come back in. And when they do come back in, they always get back in at much higher prices than they actually sold out. So um, I'm going to leave it there. That's my quick take on, on where we are. Um, you know, just, just hang in there. We've learned that eventually markets go up. And we're on a roll at the moment. If the markets are on an absolute roll, 
with the U.S. market heading back to the highs that we saw in February. Absolutely. Thank you for that, David. Um, I absolutely agree with your comment that, I mean, the source of uh, this crisis is fundamentally different. In, in 2008, 2009, we were facing a banking crisis or financial uh, system that was breaking down. So this will be obviously different and we'll need uh, a different approach. Now, on to you, Bruce. Uh, what are your views as somebody who has seen uh, various uh, market cycles? Right. This one differs. In so, uh, sorry, been through many cycles. This one differs in so far as the duration of it was extremely short. Um, most, we know that bull markets last not longer than bear markets. This is the briefest quick bear market ever in history. So that makes a big difference. And the other is, situation is different to 2008, where, as indicated before, the banks were vulnerable. They typically had 4 or 5% of their capital in reserves. Now it's about treble that, which means we haven't got a banking crisis this time. So the inference is that the um, effects of the pandemic on markets should be less long-lasting, especially, obviously, if a virus is found. Now, with the various sectors, especially hospitality and related tourism, being closed down, uh, we've got segments of the labor-intensive part of, a mar of economies which are suffering, and they've got high income multiplier effects. In other words, without government income supports, um, it's very difficult for consumer demand to be maintained. So this is a major difference to before. I'll also hark back to the technology boom uh, in, in, well, ended in 2000, 1999, where a lot of tech stocks with no earnings and no prospect of earnings were on massive multiple, well, they were ridiculously overvalued. This time around, the tech stocks are very highly priced, but they've got strong cash flow and they've got network effects, which means they benefit from economies of scale. And so it's different to 2000. But there is a big similarity, which I must mention, to the 1970s. We had a slow decline in markets. What happened there? was the Nifty 50 boom, that companies like Procter & Gamble were on 50, 60, 70 times multiples of earnings which were predictable in terms of their growth. So the market accorded them extremely high ratings, but it took over a decade thereafter for these companies to attain the prices they did in the early 70s as they grew into their earnings because the multiples came down, which were ridiculously high, which is what you've got to watch out for now with a lot of these technology stocks which are looking very attractive in earnings growth but are extremely highly valued. So a very relevant point now, the big difference again to 2008 is the central banks are much more active than they were even then. They've, they put in about double the amount of support uh, they had then, and there's a lot of fiscal stimulus also from governments, uh, much bigger than the, was the case in 2008, which is why markets have recovered so rapidly, much more than probably people would have expected, with, certainly without all the fiscal and monetary support. And also you've got China now, which is a more resilient economy than most, and it's a bulk much larger in the world than it did then, was Chinese economy has grown so rapidly. So what we see now is very low interest rates with quantitative easing and very low bond yields, which makes some of these growth equities look extremely attractive from the point of view that you can discount their earnings to the future. And the alternatives are very, very, uh, unattractive in terms of yields on cash or yields on bonds. Uh, but I will make the comment to amplify what David said, is that what we have learned from history is that equities do recover. Thank you for that, uh, Bruce. Um, just now moving on to you, Errol, what can you say about your, your past experiences in terms of market crashes relative to this one that we, we're currently facing? Market crashes are always the same. Markets are driven by two factors only, and that is fear and greed. Greed to make money or fear of losing out on opportunities. Um, this time is no different. Where there is a difference made, if I look back, is 1998 was really an emerging, emerging market set off outside South Africa. Our economy was growing satisfactorily. 2008, 2009, the great financial crisis. Uh, was after a period of good economic growth in South Africa. This crash follows several years of poor economic growth in South Africa. So in SA, unlike other countries, 
it is a little bit different this time. Uh, the other difference is the speed with which the market declined initially and then bounced back. The broad index of the market here is back to where it was at the beginning of this year, but there have been large differences between individual sectors. Thank you, Errol. Um, just lastly now with you, um, Gloria, what experiences can you share or insights can you share uh, in terms of your past experiences? Bongi, um, <laughs> when you talk about experience here, yeah, you must be over 60 years old, so that's quite frightening. Um, um, that's why all these Madalas can't even mute now. Did you see how David couldn't mute and Errol couldn't mute? Um, um, so he, here's a point for me that uh, th this particular crisis is quite humbling to all of us. Um, it has a, an awkward relationship of balancing lives on the one hand and, and livelihoods on the other hand. And, and as managers of funds, uh, we are hardly expected to, to worry about uh, this side called lives. But because it's a, a severe health crisis, we are also expected to look at that too, because so here is a case where you've got forced closures of business, uh, the forecasts are all up in the air now. Um, it's, it's, quite a, it's, quite a, it's quite a serious, forced thinking that is uh, expected of us because it's unique. And, and, and I think just to join everybody though, is that uh, it's not a crisis that cannot be overcome. We're just going to be awkward at the beginning, uh, but all the lessons of the past will be useful to undo most of what is happening because it's a crisis like any other and people have gotten out of trouble before. And so is this time we will get out of trouble. All right. And just to follow on that, uh, Gloria, um, obviously coming from a point of uh, being a chairman of the Solidarity Fund, which has been formed uh, particularly to address this pandemic that we're facing now, there's obviously no doubt that the current crisis is a moment of truth for all stakeholders to come together and tackle this. Can you maybe share some of your experiences having been appointed as chairman of the Solidarity Fund? I guess the most important thing about the Solidarity Fund is that uh, government, uh, having spoken to business, so it fit to form a Solidarity Fund which will work with business and with government, but outside of both, uh, so that it can be agile, it can be flexible, it can be nimble, uh, it can respond fast, it's not subjected to no processes of all sorts, uh, because it's a pandemic, it's a crisis, it requires quick decisions. Mm -hmm. and, and, and South Africans saw it as a great platform uh, to express their solidarity with the country in terms of supporting and donating and putting money in there and put their hands on the heart and hope that uh, it will be dealt, the money will be dealt with uh, correctly. I need to say in this forum, uh, every time you read about PPEs flowing in the rivers and all that kind of thing, that is not solidarity fund, please. Uh, we have very strict uh, accountability issues here. NSN Young, uh, ENS, all the governance things, frameworks are very tight. And we report to the donors almost every other three weeks in terms of what we've done with the money. But as that platform, it has shown how South Africans, when they are confronted uh, with something like this, they, they, they suspend all their differences and just attempt to fight for South Africa and Solidarity Fund has been that platform. It has been wonderful to see between corporates, foundations, individuals, poor people put their hand on rents there. It has been amazing, absolutely amazing, the reaction of the South Africans. Um, thank you for that, uh, Gloria. Just lastly, Errol, you alluded to a uh, crisis uh, never being really different. Um, so do you then, in, in this instance, do you feel like a lesser sense of panic or maybe a much greater investment discipline and perhaps more continuity than there was in 2008 or any other period that you've experienced? All these cycles are cycles. I don't think this cycle in terms of cor uh, correction downwards and then uh, correction upwards 
is any different broadly from previous cycle? All that differs is in the detail. Thank you. Thank you for those views. Um, just now again, in terms of um, the experience of the of the of this current cycle that we're facing, and maybe any differences really. If I go back to you, Bruce, um, look, some people have actually described uh, COVID-19 as a true black swan event where it's far beyond um, any scenario that they had modeled or even considered in the past. But I think the real question that people actually have is, in what ways is this different for you, uh, portfolio managers, if it is it, it different in, in any way? Well, certainly as an equity manager, I would say it's not significantly different apart from there's certain sectors which are suffering severely. And that's why one's going to be very cautious about looking at balance sheets and cash flow to ensure that the companies can survive the shutdowns and partial shutdowns and reduction in demand for certainly the, uh, some of the consumption areas I mentioned before, leisure and travel. For fixed interest, uh, it is certainly different because yields are either negative or nominal at best. And therefore, it means there's virtually no value at all in cash on deposit or fixed interest, which means that equities, to some extent, are the only game in town. But they're obviously historically riskier. They're more variable in their returns. Um, but the thing is that with negative interest rates and the central banks indulging in vast amounts of quantitative easing, in other words, in effect, printing money, uh, they can do that while inflation doesn't rear its head. Now, that is a concern that with supply having been reduced in many areas by the shutdowns, and some of this will have a semi-permanent effect, and with demand picking up, there could be down the road, but not yet, some inflationary issues. But obviously, this is not reflected in markets now, with long-term bond yields being, in most developed markets, close to naught or 1%. But for equity markets, one still focuses on strong companies where earnings growth is fairly predictable. And one can look through the pandemic because unlike the banking crisis in 2008, here we can see an end to this because we hope that there will be a vaccine which will allow things to go back more or less to normal in most areas apart from maybe travel by the middle of next year. So one can look through things in the meantime. Uh, but one still maintains one's quality bias. Uh, there's very narrow market leadership, in, especially in the US, but with the tech stocks. I mean, without those, the market would not be up this year at all. Um, and one thing I will certainly say is that having started in the markets in the late 60s, we're now suffering from information overload. And that's why experience is necessary to be able to now be able to discriminate what information is relevant and use one's judgment on that. Um, because information is freely available. I remember when I started, uh, you almost had to phone stockbrokers, in fact you did, to see what the prices of shares were. And if you were lucky, you had a television screen, there was a moving hand on the, on the London Stock Exchange, and you could see how prices were changing, but you had to look at a television screen to see it, um, with someone actually writing it up. So things have moved on a bit since then. And what's also changed this time is the emergence of China, as we know, as a very important economy and demand source. And secondly, also the emergence of index funds, which have grown much more. And they now, certainly in America, um, have more money in them than discretionary managed funds, which means the big get bigger insofar as if more money goes into the index funds, uh, the highly capitalized companies like Microsoft, Alphabet, um, Apple, etc., more money automatically gets plowed into them. But obviously, they can go in reverse if market sentiment's negative and money is withdrawn from these index funds, for example. Um, but that's one case why the big are getting bigger. Um, so I will say we still focus, notwithstanding the, the crisis, on the best of breed, provided that there's value there, and focus on themes and not on countries. But overall, fixed interest investment is a different, in a different era now. Um, but crucially, watch out for inflation. Um, thank you, Bruce. Um, David, I can't see your face there, but I mean, with all the experience that you have um, in the markets and with the various uh, market cycles, do you feel that you, you'd, you've approached this any different or um, you've kind of applied the same approach as before, but you are obviously now helped with 
uh, by the amount of experience that you have in the market? I know it's, 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 we, we're adopting a complete change at the moment. Um, um, what, we're not going to come out of this virus the same way as we went in. There are going to be many, many changes. And what, what this virus has done, or what this virus has done, has fast-tracked a lot of issues that um, would have taken years or decades even to have been introduced. Um, the fact that we're using Zoom now, some of us can't use it that efficiently, uh, and have had issues that, that might be a sign of age, but nevertheless, the fact that we are having this conference now the way that we are just shows you how, how far we have come. But there are going to be many, many other areas uh, as well. So we have to relook at businesses. I've taken a very, um, I've taken a very aggressive stand in structuring portfolios, uh, you know, in this sense, largely as Bruce covers, you know, interest rates are, are virtually at zero and are going to remain at zero for a long time. Yields in the U.S. are negative. What we mean by that real yields are negative is that the interest rate that you get is lower than the inflation rate. Therefore, uh, you're actually losing value of money. And, and uh, as Bruce correctly says, the only game in town in an issue like this is also um, is, is equity. The other aspect is we have to look at uh, property companies, property companies which led the way up on the JSE and have led the way up in many other jurisdictions as well have been very strong, um, very strong uh, in terms of the yield that they were giving. All of a sudden, no one wants to go back to their offices and retailers are under pressure. But I'm going to end off with um, just to give other people a chance as well. I think the other major theme that's coming through now is that governments were caught completely off guard from a medical point of view. Um, totally, health systems were, to were unprepared for this, even though there were plenty of warnings down the line. Um, you know, uh, healthcare systems were not equipped to deal with them. And I think this is one area in which a huge amount of money is going to be spent. Uh, propping up healthcare uh, systems, N pressure will, even though we've heard Trump talk about drug prices, I think pressure on drug companies will be um, uh, lifted. Uh, so we need drug companies, we need, uh, we need new drugs for all kinds of diseases, not only the popular drugs, we need healthcare systems that work, uh, more ICU units, more scientists, more nurses, more everything like that. So I think uh, when you say, you know, uh, how we are adapting to it, I think uh, completely different from the way that we went in. Very, very tech orientated, medical orientated. And Bruce brought up China as well. Don't write off China, rising middle classes. So there are plenty of opportunities, but uh, not, not the same as when we went into this, um, into this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, David, for that. Um, Errol, um, with, with this pandemic and this crisis, just from a portfolio management uh, point of view, do you feel then that you are maybe compelled to look at your investment ph philosophy any different than you had in the past? Or would you say that you will completely remain the same and maybe just use things like tactical asset allocation to make tweaks here and there? I'm never a great believer in tactical asset allocation. I think you need to structure your portfolio appropriately before things change. The thing's always changing. It's uh, the reason for this market cycle is different than the reason for the last market cycle. The next market cycle will be different. Um, but I, I, I do think we have to be careful with, at this stage in one way in most economic cycles I've seen in the past. Uh, there have been stock market crashes when the economies uh, often have taken only minor corrections. This time, our underlying economy has been badly hit. It is going to take a lot longer to see domestic profits uh, in general uh, recover to what country profits were in the past. Uh, also, it was easy in the past to structure your portfolio to have lots of income producing sh uh, shares in it. So, as David mentioned, the property companies, also the banking companies, you hold them and you get this nice flow of steady income from dividends uh, during the market correction. You'd see your prices come down and then recover. This time, if I take the property companies, they're holding back on distributions. And I think there's been a permanent change uh, to the property sectors. Many companies will permanently rebase downwards their payouts. Balance sheets in many sectors have taken a huge knock. There'll be months 
of no income for many companies, but expenses have continued putting major strains on cash positions. Uh, and this means that in the past we would rely on dividends to carry us through in bad times. Uh, that support to our share portfolios and property portfolios is not there. Um, I, I don't really believe in making too much changes to portfolios. Uh, I think we get too pessimistic sometimes, too optimistic sometimes. Young Smart said about South Africa, you know, we, the best never happens and the worst never happens. Um, I think things will recover over time. Our markets will recover. Most sectors will recover. But it just might take a bit longer than in previous cycles. And I am positioning portfolios to allow for a longer time for recovery in the underlying uh, profits and dividends uh, of the companies in which we invest. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that, Errol. Um, just now in response to, to obviously the crisis, how you're managing it and what your outlook is uh, in terms of how things play out, uh, I'll start off with you, Gloria. Obviously, in the wake of this, we've seen governments and even uh, uh, public or rather private firms making very big contributions or interventions in the economy and trying to throw themselves uh, quite uh, uh, substantially in terms of public service. What would you say is needed to actually make these interventions to have a lasting impact in the economy or markets as a, as a whole? The, the the thing which is a lasting impact already is we've never seen a government and business working so very closely together and uh, and, and throwing everything they have uh, into the problem. So that is already a, a, a big plus, the response. The response of government first in terms of how they responded first to the pandemic and, and the first things they did, they were applauded by the whole world. And then this was followed by the response of the business behind that program in terms of making it work was quite a, a touching uh, kind of response. And here is a point where in any part of the world, the big personalities, uh, when you are challenged by something this big, government and business are usually at the front line of, 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 of that. And in South Africa, it has been no, uh, it has been no, no different. I think the, the most important thing here is that both of them seem to think that uh, you do not waste a crisis. In the midst of trying to solve something, they all want to leave something that is impactful uh, and, 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 meaning and meaningful and with some legacy issues. Uh, what this has done is to expose some of our four fault lines. And, and so this also gives us the opportunity uh, to look into those pockets where business is able to partner with government meaningfully uh, to make it work. What the South Africans are looking for, both from uh, business and government, is, is a feeling of hope and assurance that uh, South Africa will survive this. It has no precedence. It has no, we have no place to refer to. Of course, even though we came later uh, in the crisis, we can't look at China and say they did it like this or look at Italy, they did it like that. We have our own local environments and our own local challenges. And so when these two uh, stakeholders have come together and, and to try to make it work, uh, we can only thank God for that. And it can't not leave a lasting impact, I think, as I said already for me, to see them working so closely together is already an impactful uh, uh, thing to look at. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Um, now, David, um, obviously in response to the crisis and uh, certainly with the objectives and targets of investors evolving to kind of reflect the various market uh, changes as this pandemic spreads. What tools have you uh, put in place in order to um, sort of adapt to these changes, if any? Um, I'm not sure tools is probably the right kind of uh, uh, word. When I say what, what, what we like to do, is 
we look at the crisis. We know we're going to come out. And we know, um, you know, Bruce has covered this as well. We know that governments have put an enormous amount of money, stimulus, into making sure that we bridge the gap. We get over the crisis. But not only do we get over the crisis, but there's enough stimulus thereafter to uh, ensure growth into the future. So that's, that's why you're seeing so much concern. Uh, the one thing that, do, that governments don't want to see happen is that we go into a, a deep recession or we go backwards. Uh, whether this creates um, uh, inflation down the line, we'll watch. But how we're, and I'm saying how we're positioning ourselves is saying, okay, what is the world going to look like in three, four, five years' time? You know, in other words, what shape will businesses be? So when we look at a company, we don't look at it from, from where it is at the moment. We rather look at it uh, from where it's likely to be. So I'm completely away from the value way of looking at things, uh, you know, looking at businesses now and saying, is there value in it? Or, or is there going to be recovered? So we like to look at those companies that are going to be promoting growth um, into the future. We're still sticking with uh, the platform companies, meaning the big ones, um, that we, you know, that are running ahead at the moment and dominate the U.S. economy. That is the 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 Apples and the Amazons and the Alphabets and, uh, and and so on. Microsoft. Um, we're still very, you know, we're still very involved in that. But we're now looking for for other companies that are going to, um, you know, that, that that are going to benefit from from where we see the the world going. Cloud is a big theme. Streaming is a big theme. Um, Disney came out with results there which were outstanding, not on their theme parks which have been closed, but rather on, on the streaming side of it and uh, constantly came to put out some new, you know, uh, uh, new content which will drive people to streaming. Gaming, gaming is something, you know, Gloria, if you think I'm a dollar, um, you wait until it comes to gaming, then I, I, it's just something that I really have absolutely no idea about at the moment. But all I do know is that thousands or millions of youngsters uh, prefer to play games and to go outside and kick a soccer ball in there. So, so you know, to, to kind of give an idea, we're thinking very much in, the, in, in, in those themes. And travel will come back, leisure will come back. The Asian economies are growing dramatically. The middle class there are spending. Uh, they, 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 they're very conscious of, um, of how they look and what they wear. Um, the aspirational, so luxury goods companies are still very, very strong. So I, I think that gives an idea of, of, of the more or less the theme that we're, we're entering into as well. And of course, I can't ignore the medical theme as well. So those are the kind of tools that we look at a company, where's it going to be three, four, five years down the line, rather than uh, where it will be at the moment. Thanks for that, David. Um, Errol, back to you. Um, I think uh, Gloria mentioned something very important that we must continue to send out a positive message and just message of reassurance that things will kind of, you know, normalize again. Um, just from an institutional client's perspective as a portfolio manager, how do you then reassure your clients that things will normalize again without having to take too drastic uh, a measure or maybe a conservative view in your portfolio management? Uh. Okay, first I think you don't want to respond after a crisis. You want to plan properly before. I think it's always important um, that once portfolios are structured in advance for what could go wrong, and things do go wrong. Every time there's a different reason why things are going wrong, you want to understand your clients, what the needs are, are they aggressive, are they defensive, and position your portfolio ahead of time for what could or for what may or may not happen. Uh, most of my clients, fortunately, take a long-term view. Uh, we understand the needs and we position them correctly in fixed interest or defensive assets, uh, as the case might be. Uh, obviously, markets are going to go up and down, um, and many clients actually see these corrections in markets that we had now as a great opportunity to actually add uh, risk assets to it. So I always say to clients, plan for long term, decide what your risk parameters are, what the returns you want, uh, and structure the portfolio for the long term. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, uh, just so 
I think in terms of your portfolio manager, specifically with your offshore equity fund and with the changes in terms of objectives and the targets of the investors, what measures have you uh, proactively or not, um, measures have you put in place just to adapt to this uh, crisis? In terms of the fund, which is most of the time fairly fully invested because it's not an asset allocation fund, it was a case of trying to see which stocks had been unduly punished in this very swift market downturn we had and increasing exposure to those. Now, David mentioned various themes, but before I get onto those, uh, Errol very importantly mentioned income generation, that for example, European banks and financial companies, generally insurers in particular, have been told to suspend their dividends, no matter whether they have the cash flow to pay, uh, pay the dividends or not. And this applies to other companies around the world too, but not necessarily government mandated. Their boards have decided that it's prudent, given the pandemic, to hoard cash. So it means that some reliable income generators, some of these shares, are no longer income generators. And so one's got to be very mindful of that because the market certainly doesn't take kindly to that, especially if it's assumed, like, say, amongst the oil companies, that there'll be a reset in the dividend policy rather than assuming that it will go back to normal in a year's time. Um, so that's one major issue. Also, David mentioned themes. Now, what one has to look at is what themes have changed as a result of this pandemic. And he identified various ones saying everything's speeded up. The changes which are taking place, like internet shopping, have been augmented in their speed. Um, and that's not going to change that rapidly. Uh, travel hopefully will come back, but maybe cautiously. Uh, but there are various themes which we focus on and try to find companies and focus on them which will benefit from these longer term themes. And I'll just briefly mention some of them. Digitalization, um, and also as David mentioned, the clouds linked into that. Industrial automation, uh, in other words, less labor intensive manufacturing. Um, and also that lends itself to social distancing, but that's hopefully not going to be a long-term situation, but certainly is for the next year. Um, shopping in the, re the retail shopping uh, areas changed completely. The high streets are being decimated, and they were arguably even before the pandemic started. Um, aging of populations in the West, and that leads to more health care. Um, and also there's a crisis of obesity, which also causes more mortalities and morbidities. And that's another thing we're talking about healthy eating and that impacts food companies and indirectly also pharmaceutical companies. That's another thing we want to see that our portfolios are exposed to. Um, because demographically, we know populations are aging. Even in China, they're aging, partly because of their one-child policy. Also, um, because of the China-US what dare one call it a spat, a bit more than that, uh, there's going to be a strong move towards reshoring. In other words, globalization is, I wouldn't say going to reverse, but certainly not going to proceed that rapidly ahead as people are concerned about the security and resilience of their supply lines. Urbanization in the third world, um, if you call China the third world and uh, Africa, is certainly taking place and that leads to changes in consumption patterns. Which consumer companies are going to benefit from that? There's also in the developed world, talking about Europe and US and Japan, of course, suburbanization, partly because of the pandemic. People don't want to live on top of each other in many cases. Um, and it depends how long the pandemic's going to, the effects are going to last. And it also has an impact, as Errol mentioned, on office space. Uh, do people want to congregate back in offices, much as it's good for the speed of core of companies, but people like working from home in many cases where they can. That applies to white collar workers. Blue collar workers are much more difficult because they're in a manufacturing process. Now, another major theme, which obviously predated the pandemic, is clean energy because of climate change. And so these are all issues which we have to take into account when we stock select. Thank you. Um, now, just looking into the future, um, Gloria, briefly, um, we almost about a quarter, about three quarters into the webinar. But um, what I'd like to just get from you is that obviously with some of the institutions, especially in our economy, having already had troubles with, with their deficits um, before even the pandemic hit, um, and we, I mean, at this rate, you're likely to see these gaps actually widen even further. Um, what are some of the economic and political pressures that may arise on, on the back of this? 
I can say, Bongi, is that the, yeah, some were already in trouble, uh, starting with our own country. Remember, we were already in a junk status. Uh, if you take our airline, was in trouble. Uh, and some of the private sector business, Sassol and so on, were kind of like struggling with one thing or another. What, what is happening now is that uh, everybody's in trouble. Uh, it would be interesting to hear what the conversations, just talking about airlines, the conversations with the Airbus and Boeing and Rolls Royce, the cancellation of orders uh, and all of that, uh, the tourism thing, uh, panel beaters, the can panel beach no car because when they lock down, people are not crashing into each other. So what I'm saying is that even though some businesses were in trouble before, everybody is in trouble at this point. And so there is a remodeling, there is a reset of the business. There's a whole lot of conversation about it can't be business as usual anymore, so everybody is in a bit of a fix. What though will happen in the meantime, the pressure on government, uh, if you take the unemployment issues, the, the restlessness of the of the community as I feel the pain about the, the some of the regulations. And this is all over the world. Everybody's unhappy with their government. It's not only here because there's abnormalities about locking people in and, and all that kind of thing. The pressures on the businesses, we were already in the job losses. This, some of the losses have been exacerbated by this and may never be recovered. Uh, so in a way, we have to plan for a new business. Everybody has got to plan for a new business. Typically an airline which depended on, on passengers, the passengers are no longer there, but the cargo uh, is allowed, cargo movement is actually allowed. So maybe most airlines are going to shift the portfolio of their business being more cargo than uh, passengers. So um, I'm just saying that, yes, the problem is getting wide for those who are already in trouble, but those who are not in trouble, they've been, it's a nasty surprise. And uh, they were caught flat-footed, they didn't plan for this, they had wonderful focus, they're not available anymore, so it's pretty much the same. Thank you for that, uh, Gloria. And briefly also from you, Errol, um, what are some of the longer-term implications, especially um, on, on institutional investor funds as a result of this pandemic? Okay, just I wanted to uh, go back to something that Bruce was talking about earlier. Now, Bruce mainly runs international equity funds. I mainly look at South African-based multi-asset funds, which can invest in all asset shares and fixed interest. Um, and we look for assets that are high yielding and have good credit quality to give our defensive and stable institutional portfolios a core of income, even in tough times. Now, when Bruce was talking, he mentioned the fact that interest rates in the USA, in Europe, in Japan, and elsewhere are zero or even below zero in some cases. South Africa, we, are, we have one thing we, we can be uh, glad about for investing is we can get yields for investors close to 10%, uh, which provides protection in difficult times, provided one holds for a period of time. Um, but going forward, I've got one big fear, uh, and that big fear is of inflation in South Africa. Not now, not inflation in South Africa for next year, but down the line. Uh, in a, an economy which is not generating growth to pay taxes, with a rising population and increasing demands for social spending, there must be a risk at some stage of inflation. Now, fortunately in South Africa, you can insure your portfolios against inflation. And the while I hate paying for insurance, insurance against long-term inflation in South Africa is currently cheap. So we have bought a large chunk of inflation protection through inflation linked bonds for our institutional uh, defensive portfolios. Fantastic. Um, thank you. And just um, from your perspective, uh, Bruce, obviously periods uh, such as this one typically uh, will lead to some 
outstanding investment uh, possibilities for those with the liquidity. And uh, in fact, those who can actually even stomach uh, uh, the, or capturing those kinds of possibilities because they have the cash. Have you been able to capture any opportunities or identify opportunities um, in this time? Well, I think the best thing I can do to show you what we are thinking of is to tell you the major holdings in the uh, Global Equity Fund, uh, Saskatchewan Global Equity Fund, um, and you'll be surprised to see that lots of technology stocks there, um, but the stocks which are over 4%, and obviously these are ones which, if we hold them in this quantity already, uh, we would obviously advocate they could be bought now, um, stocks like in the technology area, Alibaba, Amazon, Alphabet, Visa, and Microsoft. And in the consumption area, Home Depot and Nestle. And then in the medical field, Roche and Philips. Now, these address, in many cases, our longer-term themes, which I mentioned earlier on. All right. Thank you. Um, just before we make time for questions, uh, David, uh, briefly from your side, have you been able to identify any great or outstanding opportunities um, as a result of, of this pandemic? Well, we get the same input as Bruce does, so I think a lot of the discussions are around the same thing. Well, there is one thing that I do want to, to bring up, you know, when you, uh, one theme that Bruce just mentioned right at the end, which is the ESG theme, which is uh, clean air, um, which is, you know, the environment, governance, and so on, and social. And I think that the one thing that we have to be very conscious of as we go ahead um, is to actually look at this in a more serious light. Companies will not be able to get away with uh, things that they, they, they used to do. So um, why I bring that up is, is um, we swapped uh, Royal Dutch Shell and we swapped certain of our other companies for a company called Next Era which is a clean air producer in, in Florida, in the US, which uses wind power and solar power. So I'm saying we've done exceptionally well on it, simply because it's capturing, you know, it, 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 it's mm -hmm. part of the theme. So over and above what Bruce has said, those, those themes and the stock that he's brought up, um, we're starting to look at, at companies, you know, from this kind of angle those that are at the forefront of, uh, you know, of the ESG theme. A lot of the companies already are there. It's not as though uh, we're not there, but uh, we're particularly interested in, in, you know, in the clean air um, theory. The other thing that I want to say as well, just to answer, to go on to Gloria, um, an interesting part, Gloria, is you did ask, what's the future of Airbus? What's the future of Boeing? Um, and I'm using this in connection with, uh, you know, with, with the clean air theory as well. Um, fleets are going to have to be modernized because the modern fleet is, fleet is probably 40% more efficient than the old fleet. So once uh, Boeing gets its troubles done and once travel comes back, you're going to find uh, the strong demand that was there before continuing. Simply, number one, it's cheaper to run a, a more efficient plane, especially now with uh, profit under so much pressure as well. But there's also going to be a lot more pressure being put on by uh, clean energy groups uh, in, in the way that you, uh, you know, that your planes are structured. So my best plane, the one I love, the A380, which is the Airbus, is being put out of commission. Emirates still flies, why? Because it's got four big engines. And the more efficient thing is to actually only have two. So um, there are a lot of things, um, Mongi with that we, you know, that we're, that we're looking at and the ideas that we're getting as we go out, you know, into the future, uh, as we, you know, as we get to the point where we get out of this pandemic. All right. Thank you. Um, we do have a few questions and I think I'm left with just five minutes to address those. Um, so the first question is that um, in terms of retail and its challenges, where does the panel see the future of e-commerce? Well, when it comes down to um, e-commerce, we suffer a bit in this country from high internet cost and low speed, and therefore it hasn't taken off as much. And also we've got a lower income base than Europe and Far East and America. But certainly a lot of these, say, food retailing companies are doing very well out of 
the current <clears throat> situation in terms of volume, but they are not necessarily making big profits out of internet retailing because of costs of delivery. So that's a major issue. But certainly um, the share of Amazon has increased dramatically in terms of re re its percentage in retail sales, and it's a dominant factor around the world. Um, and that's not going to change. So overall, I would say that internet shopping is going to decimate, as I indicated earlier on, the high street, um, except if you can offer something unique and something which is more experiential than just purely buying things which you could buy online and have delivered very instantaneously. Um, another question that's directed uh, to you, Bruce, is that uh, what about Tesla and also to the asset managers, when are we going to see some interest in cryptocurrencies? Some big investors already do have about plus minus 25% of their assets in CC. Well, cryptocurrency is totally speculative and they've got no valuation basis whatsoever. And certainly no legitimate investor, in my view, would touch them. And it's not really a currency. Blockchain, which is the technology behind it, however, has more relevance certainly for banking and some, maybe fintech linked into banking. Um, but so certainly I'd stew that completely. With Tesla, I mean, you're flying on a wing and a prayer and belief in Mr. Musk who's done extremely well, but it wouldn't certainly pass my value criterion, but David might disagree. Um, thank I, you, I, I, Sorry, I don't disagree, not at all. But uh, what, what's interesting, Bruce, is that it seems to be a certain... He's got a, Elon Musk has got a following, and I, I battle with it. I battle to understand it. You know, it's just his personality. And I think the idea is, is people want to be associated with it. You know, I agree with you 100% on the valuation criteria. You know, I wouldn't touch it, but I watch it with interest, and I watch how followers come in and, and, and push the share price up. And what, is, what astounds me is that even analysts in, on Wall Street have, um, and, and well-respected analysts have increased their, um, their, their outlook or their target price way beyond where the shares are at the moment. But it seems to be almost a cult following that we've got in, 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 in the share, together with, you know, you get the cult following in things like Beyond Meat, which is, uh, you know, meat made out of uh, vegan-type uh, tasting meat. We know what it is. So I, I, I watch with, with interest, but... Um, I'm afraid I, I, I don't think I, you know, I agree with, uh, with Bruce. It's not one that we would touch. Okay. Um, another question is that would you not say perhaps the real Black Swan event is all the QE and fiscal stimulus that governments have pumped? Is that not artificially creating a bull market or recovery? Would you like to take that error, please? Um, QE is definitely pushing up markets around the world. Uh, central banks have created money, and this money has flowed into all sorts of financial assets, bonds, and equities. Uh, and there's a question as to how long can this go on for? I don't think, it's a question that's been asked by many academics, and I don't think we have an answer at this stage. But it is definitely creating the short-term bull market. Can it be sustained forever? Uh, there's a big question about that. All right, thank you. We're almost out of time. Uh, Gloria, do you have any concluding remarks, just about 30 seconds, uh, before we close off? Um, I, I, I just want to say that uh, it is not always going to be like this. And I think we can just use this time to rearrange uh, our lives uh, like everybody else. And South Africans have been through the worst before. And I think this is not different. Uh, I have all the hope in the world. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, we've heard the collective insights from our very experienced uh, panelists. And I think the reality really is that the magnitude and the difficulties of this pandemic's impact will not be well understood for, for quite some time to come. But I think there are obviously um, themes that are coming up, which are obviously going to be beneficial to the, the society as a whole, the investor community. And um, with that said, it's important to continue to build the trust um, with our clients uh, by doubling down on long strategies. 
uh, that will actually give them, uh, I think you all have spoken to in the session. So thank you for that. I'd like to take, take this time to thank the audience that actually registered to, to be part of this webinar. And obviously our very experienced uh, um, panelists here who've shared their, their great insights in terms of the experience and what, it, what uh, the outlook is uh, likely to be.